thing, so I was glad to actually make it here today after the crazy drive. Um, so like you said, Chris asked me to just to do a quick overview of sort of how I got here today. Um, I actually was originally a chemist. Uh, I did my undergrad at a small college called Harvey Mudd College outside of Los Angeles, purely science and engineering school. Uh, I ended up thinking I was going to major in physics, switching to chemistry, and all of my work then was nanotechnology and molecular electronics, and about as far removed from what I do now as I could be, but all of those skills I still use today, all the analyses of how to measure chemistry in water samples and soil samples and something else, it's the same type of techniques that I've just transferred into what I do now. Um, after that, I went and did a master's in chemistry at the University of Minnesota, where I was making magnetite nanoparticles and duping the, doping them with aluminum and trying to see if that changed how they reacted with carbon tetrachloride, which is a common pollutant in most rivers because it's a really common industrial solvent. Um, at that point, I said, you know, I think I want to try to see what else is out there outside of academia, maybe try, I'm not sure if this, like, chemistry thing is quite exactly what I want to be doing. And I joined an AmeriCorps program, and this was right after Hurricane Katrina and Rita slammed into the Gulf Coast. So I actually spent most of my time down in New Orleans and Mississippi doing a lot of hurricane recovery. And while I was down there, I got to meet a lot of locals who, even though they weren't trained in hydrology or water quality or fisher, or, well, some of them were fishers, fishermen, but they weren't actually trained in studying fisheries, but they could talk really articulately about how different um, canals and things that the Army Corps of Engineers had built through the wetlands down there had affected how the hurricanes had hit their towns. And so it was just kind of thinking about, okay, we're making these decisions about what we do to our landscape, and it's affecting how these natural disasters are affecting our communities. It made me start getting really interested in these environmental decision-making processes and maybe ways I could plug in as a scientist to help guide some of that decision-making and policy-making. And I got really interested in water. It kind of made me realize that I was actually always interested in water. Um, in sixth grade, we were supposed to give talks on endangered species, and I somehow convinced my teacher to let me give a talk on water instead of endangered species. So clearly, I was doomed from a young age. It took me a long time to realize it. Um, eventually, I went back to grad school. I went to the University of Colorado Boulder, where I did a PhD in environmental studies with a certificate in hydrology and accidentally picked up an environmental engineering degree along the way. Um, I'm a little bit overeducated. Um, so at that point, I was focusing in mountain watersheds, so headwater catchments relatively pristine, to understand how carbon-containing compounds are being transferred from soils into water and sort of how what chemical transformations and microbial interactions happen as they're moving from one to the other. So about half of my work was in soils environment, half of it was in water environment. I then did a short postdoc in Scotland where I was looking at water isotopes, which is something I'll talk about briefly in my talk, um, what isotopes are at least, and then a longer postdoc at the University of Utah, which is the work I'm presenting here. So uh, I'm not going to go into that in a lot of detail. But in Utah, I was moving more into urban systems, going back to that thing that originally inspired me to go into hydrology of seeing, you know, really the people interacting with the environment and the decision making they do. So now I'm here at School of Environment and Natural Resources at Ohio State. I'm almost done with my first year. I've got one more month to survive. Um, I'm starting to measure rivers in Columbus. I've been out there the last few weeks measuring a whole bunch of different headwater streams in the Columbus area. Since we just were collecting samples two days ago, I don't have data for that, so I'm showing you some older data instead. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to be here. So. so I'm going to talk to you today about sewer sheds and watersheds and how essentially human engineering is overlapping natural hydrologic processes and what that means for water quality in the environment. Um, I know we have a range of backgrounds in this room and different background um, ideas and sort of skill sets. Um, I'm going to try to make sure I explain things. If you're confused at one point and just have a point of information question, go ahead and raise your hand and interrupt me so that you're not continuing to be lost through multiple slides. Um, this is all work I did while I was at the University of Utah. Uh, this list of names is just a small number of my collaborators. There was one day where we had 50 people out sampling everywhere. Um, and this was part of a project called iUtah. Um, so, get enough sun off the bat. So when we think about all over the planet and all over North America, urban populations have been steadily increasing. People are largely moving from rural areas into urban areas. It's happening in North America. It's happening all over in the U.S. We're seeing sort of percentage of urban population continually increasing. And when we think about cities, we realize cities are usually built along waterways or built along rivers. There's a lot of cities that have really iconic rivers. You've got the Thames in London. Um, Chicago's got their Chicago River all over. And People built cities on rivers because you, they needed water to survive. Rivers were used to carry um, sewage and waste away from the city. They were used as a water source. They were used for transportation. They were used as water for irrigation, not just for people. So they're really important arteries, and we tend to be drawn to them um, 
as, as people, and so they provide all these ecosystem services and things that we need. But we also impact them by changing how they function. So one of the big questions I have is what's controlling water quality in streams? If you went to this stream, it looks really beautiful, right? Um, so if you went there and you took a sample, maybe you'd find there's really high nutrient concentration that's causing an algal growth. Maybe you'd find that there is contamination of arsenic or lead or some sort of toxic metal. Maybe you'd find um, residue from dry cleaning chemicals that are no longer legal but are still in the ground and getting into our stream. There's all sorts of different things you might see in the stream, but if you want to try to solve that problem, you have to know what's causing it. And so one of the first questions of that is how is it getting there? Is it getting there? What flow path, essentially, what water is carrying it to that spot? And so if we think about sort of different flow paths that could happen, the water that got to that spot, maybe it came from precipitation. Maybe you know, it was one of the handful of raindrops that actually falls directly into a water body. Maybe it just came from upstream. I realize in this case it's a culvert that's going under a road, but maybe it's just water that was carried from upstream. And so that source of that contaminant that I measured is coming from somewhere upstream. Or maybe it's coming in from the groundwater. Every stream has groundwater at various points that it's flowing into it. Maybe it's something that's underground that's being carried in the stream at this location. So if I want to figure out how to solve that water quality problem, I need to go to that source to see what's bringing it to that location. So when you think about natural watersheds, if you Google what's a watershed, you might see an image like this. This is from the um, National Wildlife Foundation. And there's lots of different types of water bodies we might be looking at. We might be looking at streams and rivers and how they're connected. And some of those are going to be intermittent or ephemeral, so they only have water in them sometimes. Some of them will be perennial, so they'll always have water flowing in them. You're also going to have wetlands. Some wetlands have surface flows into these rivers. Some of them kind of stand alone, but they actually have groundwater that they're feeding groundwater into the rivers. So there's all these different ways of thinking how water bodies on our landscape are connected. And so that connection is important for understanding what's controlling water quality within our system. So we have our natural landscape. And so I got an example from the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District, somewhat closer to Stone Lab than um, where that other district was. So as an example, if you go to the Northwest Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District, you're going to see this map of, okay, this is how a watershed works. You have stuff, rain or snow coming in at high elevations, it's melting, it's entering streams, you have groundwater also kind of parallel in the streams, it's eventually ending up in Lake Erie. And then if you say, okay, Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District, what happens when we add a city? And then you see all these other things that we've done to alter the watershed. So for instance, we bury headwaters. These headwaters, especially the ones that are intimate or ephemeral, we tend to bury them. We turn them into pipes, we just cover them up. And so they go away. Um, they kind of end up underground. We maybe add storm culverts, so um, taking stormwater, having it run over concrete areas and be deposited straight into a river. We create waste, treated wastewater that we put into our rivers or our lakes or our streams. Um, we change all these things, but did you notice what's missing here? So this last slide, we have these arrows on the side for underground. Do you see any groundwater here? Do you think that groundwater went away completely just because we built a city over it? It doesn't, but if you look consistently over and over and over again, all the sort of schematic ideas of how we conceptualize water in a city tends to ignore that groundwater input. Um, so this is an example of sort of we've taken our natural system and we've put a sewer shed over it. We've created the natural, taken the natural watershed, we've added a sewer shed on top of it, maybe changing where, how things are connected by adding these pipes. So this is from the Baltimore Ecosystem Study, which is a whole giant watershed study in the city of Baltimore. And the dark blue is, was the natural river. And all of the lighter blue lines are all of the sewers that were created that are feeding into that river now. So it's all, we've, they sort of are man-made, have water streams that are feeding into the river. So this idea we have in cities, we have the natural hydrologic processes, the natural watershed. We have this human-engineered watershed we've put on top of it. But it's important to remember that even though we put that human engineered watershed on top of it, we haven't removed all of that natural functioning. So it's really this idea of seeing these two coexisting together and how they're in impacting each other. Um, so we think about urbanization, we think about lots of different ways that we're affecting how streams function. So I talked about headwaters being buried, and you also see channelization. You saw that in the, the pictures from London on the first slide where we're making streams really straight, we're surrounding them by concrete, we're saying, you are going to stay in this channel. Now, natural streams over the years will change where they're located, but we're forcing them to not do that. If you're putting your house next to a stream, you don't want it to change where it's located. So there's a reason that we're doing that, but we're still then changing physically how it's flowing. Uh, one thing this causes is higher flood pulses. So normally in a rain event, it will take a while for all that rain to get to a stream, so you won't get quite as high or sharp of a pulse of water through your stream. 
everything is channelized, it's being diverted right into that stream, and your, your high event is going to be higher and quicker because of that. So you're changing that physical dynamic of how the streams function. We're also changing it chemically. Uh, road salt is a big one in a lot of areas of the country, and what you see on the side of the road here, we're adding all this salt that ends up washing the stream. It's changing the salinity of our stream. We're also changing it chemically by whatever gets dumped out of pipes, so <coughs> higher nutrient contents, um, maybe pharmaceuticals or things that we can't remove in wastewater treatment plants, all that is changing the chemistry of the stream. And then there's also the biology. So we're in introducing invasive species. We're also, all these different chemical and physical changes will also affect the biota in the stream by altering the habitat, changing what can grow and what can't grow. <coughs> when you're thinking about sort of water quality and stream quality, you want to think of all these different parameters, the chemical, the physical, and the biological. A lot of what I'm going to talk about is the chemical. Um, I was a chemist back in the day. But um, all these things are all interrelated when we're thinking about these systems. So like I mentioned, if you were to Google um, urban hydrology or urban watershed, these are the types of images you're going to see. You see rain hitting the roof, going along the street, going into street runoff, going into drain, being piped into the stream. We don't see that interaction with the subsurface. And to some degree, there's a reason for that. When we make cities, we create impervious surfaces. We put all of the concrete, all of the asphalt down on the ground, and we're limiting how much water can actually get underground. So if we look on the this left um, diagram, you can see with natural groundwater, if you didn't have any of that concrete or asphalt, and it rained, then about 50% of that rain is going to go underground. It's going to go under the surface. But when you've got a city, when you've got that impervious surface, you might only have 15% of that water going to the surface. So we are changing that dynamics. We are sort of potentially limiting the ground, world groundwater is playing, but we're not getting rid of it completely. And most cities aren't completely covered with asphalt. We do have parks, we do have lawns, things like that. And those are places where water can infiltrate. So urban water management has historically conceptualized the stream as a pipe. The stream is a pipe. You've got water flowing from one end to the other. You have pipes of water from different sun coverts that are delivering stuff into the stream. Once it gets into the stream, it stays there, and it keeps continuing to be carried down. To, down. We know natural watersheds. That's not true. We know that water in a stream in the natural watershed is going in and out of the subsurface over and over and over again. So we know the stream is not a pipe, but traditionally we, use, we think of it that way. And so when we make management decisions with our streams, we think pipe, pipe, pipe. Um, so this was a, Ken Bencala was one of the first people to sort of really coin this idea of the stream is not a pipe. And um, so it's the idea that water, once it gets to the stream, isn't just carried downstream, it's constantly moving back and forth and exchanging with the soils and the catchment. Okay, so to show an example of how this becomes useful information, where it's interesting, um, I want to take you to Utah. So right now, Ohio is really hot and humid. Utah is really hot and dry. It's also currently on fire. Um, but we got Salt Lake Valley in Utah. So Salt Lake Valley is where Salt Lake City is. Almost the entire population of Utah lives in this one tiny corner of the state. It's where water is, so it's where the people are. Um, so what you have here is at the top of the blue, you've got the Great Salt Lake. And down here, you have Utah Lake, which is having it has this algal bloom almost as bad as Lake Erie's at the moment. And you have this red line is the Jordan River, which flows up uh, from Utah Lake to the Great Salt Lake. And you've got Provo and Brigham Young University on this end, and Salt Lake City and UC University of Utah on the other end, and almost the entire population of Utah lives just in what you're seeing right here. Um, and so the Jordan River is highly impacted. Um, it's not meeting a lot of EPA criteria. It's too hot. There's not enough oxygen. There's too much E. coli not in very good shape. There's a lot of wastewater treatment plants that feed into it. There's agriculture areas that feed into it. Um, and so what I'm going to focus on is just one of the tributaries. There's seven um, tributaries that go through the Salt Lake Valley and end up into the Jordan River, which ends up in the Great Salt Lake. And for this talk, I'm going to focus on Red Butte Creek, which is the one in the upper corner right there. So Red Butte Creek is a really cool study site because it's protected up in the canyon. So it used to be owned by the U.S. Army, and it was a protected watershed of this water is only for our base. No one else can go into this watershed. Um, and once they moved out of that base, they gave it to the Forest Service, and the Forest Service says, hey, you know, we have this, perf this essentially untouched area. We're going to make it a research natural area. So only researchers with permits are allowed inside of it. It's not untouched, but it's about as untouched as you can get this close to a city. So what we have is about six kilometers from the headwaters to the city of relatively pristine, about as natural as you can get um, type of system. And then as soon as it hits the city, it's immediately in a heavy populated area. It goes right through the University of Utah, right through neighborhoods that are 100 years old. So we're going from a natural watershed to a highly urbanized watershed in a very short distance. And so that creates a really nice natural experiment for us. 
Um, there is a small reservoir at the base of the canyon, um, but it's still, we will see impact of the reservoir in what we're doing. Um, so just kind of give you an idea of what Red Butte Creek looks like. It's not very big. I think at its deepest, it was a little deeper than my ankle. Um, so the first several kilometers of the canyon look like in the upper picture. You've got some incising in the banks. Um, there's lots of pine trees up there. It's rocky. It meanders downstream. It's relatively shallow. Um, at the canyon mouth, that's just where it comes out of the reservoir, and there is a hiking path there and lots of dogs and people there all the time. And then in this last urban kilometer was that picture I showed you in the first slide. Um, it's really pretty with all its construction cones in the water and everything. Great stream. Um, and after, after about half a kilometer beyond that urban site, it actually gets pumped underground and then stays underground all the way to that Jordan River. So Red Butte Creek is largely chemostatic. Let me go over what that means. So a lot of times in hydrochemistry, we look at what are called concentration discharge curves. So the x-axis is discharge. Discharge is essentially flow. It's how much water is being transported down the stream. So it's a combination of the volume of the stream and how fast it's going. And then the y-axis is concentration of whatever solute we're looking at. In this case, we're looking at sulfate, magnesium, sodium, and chloride. For the most part, these are solutes that largely come from rocks. And so if we see them, they're probably from groundwater. They're from water that's been, been underground for a while, had time to dissolve all these materials from the rocks before it's entered into the river. Um, and these are also material that isn't going to get eaten really quickly by bacteria. It's not a limiting nutrient. It's not a nitrogen or a phosphorus that they're really excited by. It's a fairly stable compound in rivers. So what we're looking at here is discharge and concentration relationships for one spot in Rebute Creek. And notice we have a log scale here. So these are really large changes in orders of magnitude. So we're seeing discharge going from essentially zero to 100. So several orders of magnitude of change in discharge. And yet, over that time period, there's almost no change in the concentration of these solutes. And if you think about what causes discharge to increase, what makes the river get bigger, essentially one of two things. You have snow melting, creating a large pulse of water that goes into the stream, or you have a really big rainfall event, so a big impulse of water to the stream. And if that's happening, those two different sources of water should have a different chemical signature than groundwater, right? Because they haven't spent a lot of time hanging out with the rocks if they're just coming down from the clouds. So if that was true, if the new water in the stream during a rain event was from that precipitation, you would expect a significant difference in concentration as you see an increase in discharge, but you don't. So what this is suggesting is that even in these large input events, these snow melt events, these rain events, in spite of we know that this new water is coming into the catchment, the water that's in the stream isn't new water. It's water that's been stored in the catchment and is getting pushed out by this new input of the newer water. Um, and so essentially, chemostatic means chemo is chem and static is the same. So the chemistry isn't changing with the discharge relationship. What this is telling us is that Red Butte Creek is a groundwater dominated system. Even during high flow events, the vast majority of the water in Red Butte Creek is from the ground. Um, and we see this in a lot of rivers. This is really, really common, um, particularly in anything that's remotely mountain, hilly type of region. Any snow dominated system, they're almost always groundwater dominated. Um, it's not quite as true in, in places like Ohio. I'm still trying to figure out which ones in Ohio are this way or not. Um, but it's very common. So we know that groundwater is hugely important in delivering water to streams. It's why we still have water in our rivers if it hasn't rained in two months. Um, so large, Red Butte Creek is largely chemostatic, except when it's not. So when we start in the canyon, it's chemostatic. We go a little bit down the canyon, it's chemostatic. We go a little bit further down the canyon, it's chemostatic. We enter the urban system, it's chemostatic. We go two kilometers in the urban system, it's chemostatic. And then all of a sudden, at that spot I've been showing you with all the traffic cones inside of it, all of a sudden it's not chemostatic anymore. All of a sudden, you're seeing a much larger range in concentration. And so we're, what we wanted to do to go, was essentially be detectives, figure out what was causing, what was different in this location. Is it different in hydrology? Is it different in the, in the quality of the inputs that are happening there? And which inputs are entering the stream there? Why would it suddenly change behaviors in this location? These locations are only a couple kilometers apart, so it shouldn't be a huge difference, and yet we see this sudden big change. So we put on our detective hats, and we measured pretty much everything we could think of to measure. So we did what are called synoptic surveys. A synoptic survey is getting a snapshot in time of a particular river. So essentially going out and getting as many samples as we can in one day. So each one of these samples, each one of these dots, is approximately a half kilometer apart. And we got these all in one day to try to see what does this river look like right now? And can we see these differences occurring and try to pinpoint what's causing them? We did these in lots of different times. We did it in summer and spring and winter and fall. 
the idea is that this is a seasonal base flow. It's whatever this river looks like not during a precipitation event during that season. Because Utah is a snow dominated system, which means that you have the highest pulse in the spring when the snow is melting, and you're driest at the end of summer when it's had a really dry period for a while. So maybe we have different dynamics in these different seasons. And we measured, I don't know, I think it was like 45 different parameters. I'm not going to show all of them. Um, so what we're going to be looking at here is the data from these surveys. And we're starting at the headwaters at zero kilometers downstream. We're going all the way to 12 kilometers, which is that site with all those traffic cones in it. And the reservoir, so the mouth of the canyon, is located around six kilometers. So it's nice and easy. The first six are the canyon, the second six are um, the urban system. And right now, here we're looking at discharge, so just how much water is there. And so there's kind of two ways of thinking about a stream in terms of groundwater. You can have a gaining stream, which means that the water table is higher than the level of the stream, and so water from the ground is feeding into the stream. Or you can have a losing stream, which means the water table is lower than the level of the stream, and so you have water from the stream feeding into the ground. And streams will often, at different points along the stream, you might have a losing system turn into a gaining system, turn into a losing system again. It's very rare that they're going to be all of one or all of the other the entire distance. And so what we see here is that for the six kilometers of the canyon, we just see a very slow, steady increase in discharge. So what they're telling us is we have a gaining stream. We have consistently groundwater feeding the stream the whole way. Uh, we don't really see a huge difference in the seasons, surprisingly. It was just kind of a good, steady flow. Um, in this area from about six to nine kilometers, which is the University of Utah, where we have a ton of storm culverts that feed into the stream, and we have sort of a bench um, before we get another drop in elevation, you see this huge variability um, in discharge. It's hugely variable between the different sampling events. So we had some really, really high discharge events, some really, really low ones in between. We don't have a really clear losing or gaining. Some stretches gain sometimes, some lose sometimes. It's sort of a, everything's changing all the time in this location. But at the end of this gap, it was always losing again. Um, just below this site, was almost sometimes gets dry completely in the summer. Um, and then where we start, where we see that, um, we see this change at the end where discharge starts to go up again. So we have a gaining system near the end, but it gets less variable now. It's gaining, but we don't see as much seasonal variability. It's just consistently groundwater feeding into it. So then we want to say, okay, what other sort of pieces of evidence do we have? And the next one looked at was water isotopes. So focusing here on oxygen. So almost all of your water molecules have oxygens with weight of 16. A very, very tiny fraction of them have a weight of 18. And the waters that have O18 atoms in them, when it rains, those are going to fall out first because they're heavier. And when evaporation happens, the lighter ones are going to evaporate first. So we can actually use the ratio of the O16 to O18 to actually trace the source water. If we Different waters that fell at different parts along the mountain are going to have a different ratio. So we can actually use that to trace the water itself rather than just tracing the chemicals that are dissolved in that water. So if we see a change in those ratios, either something happened like evaporation that caused a change, or it's a different source mixing. So maybe you have two different sources and they're mixing in different proportions, you're going to have two, a different ratio of these two isotopes. So in the canyon, we just see a very slow, steady increase of O18, and that's indicative of evaporation. We actually um, could calculate that back out and see yeah, if, if this would, um, evaporation does explain this slow increase. But then after that reservoir, and evaporation would be occurring in the reservoir, we see a jump in that urban area where there's a lot of variation in discharge, but we also see a spreading out in the types of isotopes we see across the seasons. So what we're what we think we're seeing here is we're seeing these different sources that have different degrees of isotopes, and they're mixing in different portions at different seasons. So maybe sometimes you have a lot more coming from upstream and a lot less coming from the ground. Some of the times your proportion is mostly from the ground and less from upstream. So you're seeing a greater variability, and that's spreading that data out. And then when we get to that gaining section at the end, where we have a lot of groundwater feeding into the stream, we start to see things narrow out again. So that groundwater seems to be a one single consistent source that's feeding that stream again. We're not seeing as much variability in source when we get to that spot. And then finally, look at chloride. Chloride is a very common indicator of urban impacts because of all the salt that we put down on our roads. Um, a lot of cities are starting to hit the point where um, the salt in the rivers is too high for a lot of freshwater species because we're putting so much salt on our roads. And so chloride is very, very low in the canyon. If you zoomed in, you'd see it increasing just a tiny little bit, and that's purely about from evaporation. In this urban section, we see the huge variability in the difference in sources. We do see a tiny spike in chloride during the winter. There actually is a giant pile of salt that sits right next to the stream um, during the winter. But even in spite of that, we don't see a huge increase. 
Um, we did measure during a rain on snow event, and we did get up to about 3,000, but it went back to, you know, about 40 the next day. But then in this spot where we see this gaining minimal source, all of a sudden the chloride goes up four or five times. Nitrate does the same thing. We kept seeing everything we measured completely changed in that location. It was always indicative of, of large amounts of urban impacts. This nitrate is spiking, this chloride is spiking, uh, potassium is spiking, everything's changing at that location. So then we took these three different reaches, the sort of canyon, that upper urban variable reach, and that lower urban reach, and sort of summarized all the data together. So when we look at calcium, calcium comes from rocks. And Utah had that Great Salt Lake, and it used to be the bottom of an ocean. And so you've got a lot of broken up calcium-rich rocks that are sort of underneath all of Salt Lake City. And so the canyon is pretty consistent in calcium. That lower urban, you see the sudden increase in calcium. And so that's saying, okay, so this is water that's really been hanging out in those rocks that are under Salt Lake City, giving us more evidence that we didn't really need at this point that it is groundwater. And there happened to be a lot of springs that we could sample in that area, so we could sample the groundwater directly. And the calcium in those springs was almost identical to the calcium concentration in, in our streets. So more evidence, again, that this groundwater is what's feeding that stream. Um, we looked at nitrate, and we're very low in the canyon, very low in that, ur in that upper ur urban section, in spite of all those storm culverts and everything else that's delivering water into but then we see that big spike in that lower urban section. We see that the springs, the groundwater is really high in nitrate. Dissolved organic carbon starts pretty low. Um, this is normal in low nutrient mountain streams, that low of a concentration. We get a bit of a spike in the upper urban, and I think that's because microbes and algae have had to have a little bit more time before water is disappearing into the ground again, so you're being able to have a bit more um, photosynthesis and production of carbon happening in that section. It starts to drop in, sprint in the lower urban, and it's driven by the low carbon in the springs. Groundwater systems are very low in carbon because you can't photosynthesize underground, so this organic carbon is getting used as the nutrient source instead. Dissolved organic nitrogen, which is the preferential form of nitrogen for microbes before nitrate, is very low, but it's non-existent in the groundwater. So the idea here is that you need, the microbes are eating up all the DON, and then they're trying to denitrify the nitrate, but they need carbon to do denitrification, to use up all that nitrate pollution. But they're so low on carbon, they're running out of it before they can denitrify. So we have so much nitrate pollution under the ground that the microbes can't take care of all of it before it's being delivered into the stream. Um, one little fun side note. So one time when we sampled, and these are the gray samples, we got to this point and our stream was dry. And this was snow melt after a really high snow year. And it turns out when you sample urban systems, the city can shut your um, stream off which was exciting, but the cool thing is, you can't see it very well, but where Mallory is standing, there's actually groundwater upwelling in that spot. So we could actually go down and find the first spot where groundwater was actually entering the stream. And as we walked, it became more and more groundwater as we went. So we could really nail down, this is definitely groundwater that we're sampling. Um, so the other cool thing is in that lower site, so the stream mostly comes from upstream, but there is one diversion that can be turned on or off and it's going to a cemetery because you need to water the dead people. And so usually you have higher flows coming from upstream and then you have groundwater coming in. But sometimes there's lower flows coming from upstream because they've diverted that water for a little while. So we actually get the step function when they turn it off and on those gates. And so when you look at this stage, which is just the height of water which is related to the discharge, when the stage is high, that means all the upstream water is coming down. When the stage is low, that means more of the water is coming from the groundwater because there's less water coming from upstream. And we see an inverse relationship between our nitrate concentration and our stage. When you have more water coming from upstream, that's low nitrate water. And so then overall, you have less nitrate in your stream because that's diluting the high nitrate water from the groundwater. When you've got those gates open, there's less low nitrate water coming from upstream, more high nitrate water proportionally seen in the groundwater, so you have the higher nitrate in the signal. That's an example of that human natural hydrology all combining together. Um, so, sewer sheds. I told you we'd talk about sewer sheds. Um, this is Redview Creek. This is in that upper urban section. This is the University of Utah campus. There's four really large storm culverts that drain parking lots and buildings and all that kind of stuff directly into the stream. And so we also sampled those. And so we had four of them that like, instrumented, and they're about two kilometers apart. There's several other smaller ones, but we were most, we mostly had the really big ones instrumented. And we actually started outlining where the sewers are draining into and going out during rainstorms and measuring water coming off of buildings and gutters and parking lots and cars and everything we think of to try to, try to pin down where this chemistry is coming from. Is it mostly from roofs? Is it mostly from parking lots? What's going on? 
is not my project. This is someone else's who she's hopefully going to get them her master's this year. Um, but it is being done. It's kind of like a way of trying to pin down what the sewer shed is doing. What we did do here is we had those storm drains. And so we had an instrumented upstream site that was measuring flow every 15 minutes and a downstream site. And those are, I think, a little over a kilometer apart. And we had the four biggest culverts all instrumented. So we're not getting all of the water that's being diverted into the stream by human engineering, but we're getting most of it measured, right? So what you're seeing here is one storm event, and the upper is just how much, when the rain happened. And that's sort of every 15 minutes sort of collecting how much water fell in those 15 minutes. What you're seeing in the middle panel is the stream response, so how much flow is happening in the river in response to that storm event. The black line, which is pretty much flat, is the upstream location. So the upstream location is before we put any impervious surfaces down, it's before any urbanization occurred. That natural system can absorb all of that rain and feed it in so slowly that you don't see a response to the storm event and the flow of the river from that natural system. One kilometer downstream, we suddenly added parking lots and roads, and we've totally changed how the system is engineered, and you get this red um, signal. So that red signal is the downstream location. You suddenly see this really large storm pulse entirely because we're causing all that water to be diverted into the stream. What's interesting is that blue signal is the sum of those four culverts. Now remember, there's more than those four, so it's an underestimate of how much water we're delivering into the stream. So you notice that red signal is smaller than that blue signal. So what that means is that some of that water is the water that's coming in from those storm culverts is disappearing before it gets to that downstream location. We know that storm culvert water is not really good water quality. It's high salt, it's got oils from the parking lots, all that kind of stuff. And as soon as it hits that stream, it's almost immediately feeding underground. It's the only place it could have gone. If it's not in the stream down there, it's gone underground. So we have evidence that contaminated water is immediately feeding into that subsurface, and that's probably what's coming out further downstream. Um, it does vary. So as much as 50% of the water coming from the culverts can go down. Sometimes it's 0%. It depends on the time of year and where the water table is. But overall, that storm culvert water is going underground. Um, so there's a variation. Sorry, I forgot I had that slide on there. Um, it's a handful of storms. We had, I mean, two years of them measured. So think about it. That groundwater has two potential sources of water. There is regional water coming from the mountains. This is all the snow that fell in the mountains. It melts and it ends up recharging from the mountains into the, into the groundwater, and that groundwater come out eventually downstream. And the other source to that subsurface in the urban environment is urban runoff from your local watershed. It's stuff from your parking lot that's going into your storm drain and being delivered into your stream. It's essentially these two main sources we can think of for what's feeding that urban groundwater system. So what we could do is a mixing model based on those two samples, and we go back to our trusty isotopes. So we took samples from um, the end of the canyon. We called that our regional end member. So we said that this is what water looks like when it's leaving the mountains. And that's that blue square that's kind of hidden underneath all those little orange dots just to the left of the circle. Um, and then we had a couple years of precipitation samples in Salt Lake City. And we had those isotope values. So an average value of the precipitation that's hitting the ground, that that's what's carrying the urban contamination underneath the ground. And that's that blue triangle. And um, the yellow dots, so the orange and the red dots are um, all in the canyon. The yellow dots are all in the urban system. You can see those fall between those two circles. So if a dot is closer to the blue circle, it's proportionally more weighted from that one and less from the other one and vice versa. So if the yellow dot was all the way over here, it would be almost entirely precipitation water and only a little bit of mountain water. So essentially along the continuum. And we can know what proportion it is. So we use um, this mathematical equation to see what percentage of this groundwater that we're measuring is from the mountain water versus what percentage is from water that's recharged in the urban environment. And what we found was that we're predicting about 13 to 23 percent. And for various reasons, this is an underestimate. What that's saying is that all of that subsurface water that we get in Salt Lake City, about 20 percent of it is from the urban environment. So about 20 percent of the water under there is being fed from things that pick up urban contamination as they go underground. And about 80 percent is coming from the mountains. So theoretically clean, pristine water. So 80 percent, 20 percent approximately. So you have this clean aquifer. You're getting this sort of dirty water entering into it. And then when we get to a point downstream, what's coming out is now this contaminated groundwater. Um, I'm going to skip this slide. So pretty much what this is saying is that if we think about how we want to model urban hydrology, if we conceptualize the stream as a pipe, we have our stream flowing downstream, where storm culverts 
putting water into it, the stuff that's in it stays in it and continues downstream. In that case, there's no flow boundary to, work, to worry about in terms of flow between um, the subsurface or the ground and the stream itself. Once it's in there, it's there. We don't have to worry about it flowing back and forth. It also means that any contamination is going to happen during this time scale of an event. It's only when stuff is coming in through the storm culverts that it's going to be in the stream. And if it was a week since the last storm, you shouldn't have anything left in your stream because it should have been carried away. Um, the next thing people start thinking about is hyperiac exchange. Hyperiac is just a little bit of sort of land next to the stream and under the stream where stream water is actually going back and forth constantly between the stream um, and the river. And we know streams are constantly doing what's called hyperiac exchange, water going back and forth in and out of the stream. Um, there's a big redox gradient, so different um, nitrogen processes can happen down there because there's no oxygen. It can happen in the stream that's oxygenated, for instance. So hyperiac exchange is really dominant in these systems. Then when we have to think about where contaminations are getting in and where we need to do remediation, we need to think of a spatial scale of meters. So we only need to worry about any contamination that might happen within a couple meters of the stream. And we only need to think about minutes to days. That's about how much time it takes for water to go back and forth. So smaller time scale, smaller space scale. But if we start to think about this alluvial exchange, alluvial being essentially all the landscape that's going to end up feeding into the river, this changes our time scale and our space scale in which we need to think about how we might want to manage our rivers, how we might want to do remediation. Now, you know, something you spill a kilometer away, even if it goes underground, can eventually still get into your stream. You know, so you've got a much bigger space scale to have to think about. Well, this is a much bigger time scale. Stuff, water moves much slower under the ground than it moves above the ground. And so you have a much longer time scale, much longer residence time if it's staying under there. So something that I spill could still be there 50 years from now and still taking that long for it to come out. Um, this makes policymakers very sad because they want to see results to things they do, and it might mean that you do this beautiful stream restoration, but it's still going to take 30, 40, 50 years to see a response because it takes that long to flush out the subsurface. Nobody wants to hear that I'm not going to see a difference in 30 or 50 years, especially if you have an election in two years. Um, so it's kind of the sad story. Um, essentially changing how we're thinking about it. So I'm going to look at a thought of just a local plot now. Well, local when I was in Columbus, I guess we're a little further away from it now. A lot of cities are putting in green infrastructure as part of large stormwater management plans. Um, I'm highlighting Columbus here, but there's tons of cities that are doing it all over the world. One of the big things that they're doing is rain gardens. These are some of the ones my dog and I like to go check out the rain gardens every often while, see how they're, how they're coming. Um, so they're putting all these rain gardens in all over Columbus as a way of managing our combined sewer outflows. The idea here is that all this rain used to be funneled along the curb, go into our storm drains, and get funneled right into our rivers. And our sewer system is connected to our river, so when it got overwhelmed, that would end up being raw sewage dumped into Owen Tangy River, um, which is not good. And so they're trying to find ways, and combined sewer outflows is really common in sort of from Ohio to sort of east to the Atlantic in this kind of part of the country. And so they're trying to find ways of solving this problem without having to completely redo the entire sewer system underground because that's kind of prohibitive. And so if we can limit how much stormwater is entering our combined sewer outflow, then we won't overflow it and we won't end up washing the raw sewage into the river. So one of the ideas of green infrastructure is getting that stormwater to be percolated in the ground the way it naturally would have been instead of being put into these pipes. So rain gardens is one way that does it. So you can imagine all this water that we flushed down the curve is going to hit this rain garden instead. And there's very specific types of gravel and sand and dirt and plants there that will encourage the water to percolate underground and to hopefully clean it, take away some of the nutrients things as it does. And these are great, but we still don't really know how well they work. Um, they're being installed all over, and there is research on them, but it's still sort of in its infancy. So we still don't really know for sure how well they're removing things, what, if they're, how many we need to put in a river to, in a city to make a big enough difference of how much water we're diverting, things like that. And if we think about the fact that, okay, we're taking the stormwater and we're putting it underground, Underground isn't, it might be out of sight, but it's not necessarily out of mind, at least in terms of river, that groundwater is still getting there eventually. So we want to make sure that whatever we're doing is really going to clean whatever the contaminants that stormwater is carrying under the ground with it. Um, we look at a bigger issue, and ironically, I uh, quoted Scott Pruitt here, and he stepped down about three hours ago. Um, but <laughs> um, the Clean Water Act was passed in the 1970s. Yeah, I, literally my friend texted me as I was driving up here, and I'm like, I put a quote from him on my slide. Um, so the Clean Water Act was passed in the 1970s, and it was huge. It's pretty much why rivers in our cities are no longer like the scary place nobody wants to go, but the expensive waterfront area where 
the clubs are and the, the nice places to be. There's parks and walkways and things like that. It's all about cleaning up our rivers. Um, but the Clean Water Act was initially, and policy people can probably describe this way better than I can. Um, the Clean Water Act was designed as all these rules and regulations for improving the water quality um, of, of our waters in the United States. But it didn't necessarily do a great job of defining exactly which bodies of water it applied to. And so a couple of years ago, they next passed the Waters of the United States Act, which defined more specifically exactly which water body the Clean Water Act was applied to. Um, the EPA at the moment is seeking public comment, trying to roll back that Waters of the U.S. Act and change, essentially take away some of the water bodies that the Waters of the U.S. Act said were included within that Clean Water Act. And one of the things that they're talking about removing is groundwater. So Scott Pruitt has this quote when they announced it of proposing that groundwater is not a water of the United States. And he says it's how you save the economy a billion dollars, but if we're putting stuff into the ground and that groundwater is connected to our streams, if you're using a drinking well and that groundwater is important, letting that not worrying about what contaminants end up in the groundwater could end up having implications on the rivers that are being um, protected by the Clean Water Act. So this understanding of how hydrology works, this connectivity of how all these water bodies are connected is really important for thinking about how do we keep our waters clean. So the EPA is currently open for comments on this. So if you care about this and learn anything from the study and you want to make one, um, feel free to do so. Um, so just thinking about this matters from local implications, from what we think about green infrastructure. It matters from national, from national implications and how we decide how we protect our water quality in, in our different um, areas. Okay. So, last slide. Um, longer residence time on the subsurface expands the time scale of impacts. Water stays longer time on the subsurface. If they have polluted water down there, it's going to be a much bigger time scale and a much bigger spatial scale than just what's happening in the river. So when we're restoring parts of our rivers or trying to manage our watershed better, we need to think about these larger scales than just the stream that we see. Um, that urban subsurface, just like in a natural system, is a biogeochemical reactor. We have carbon and nitrogen processing happening under there. We may have different types of microbes, but we still have microbes and things are still going on. So we need to recognize that stuff that we put underground is transforming before it gets back into the river. So maybe there's things we can do um, to encourage certain things that are going to maybe eat the nitrate more. Maybe we can put um, restore riparians in with plants that are going to take a lot of that nitrate up before that water feeds into the stream. The fossil solutions we can use based on that understanding of that reactor. And when we think about the subsurface, we need to think about that. When we're thinking about green infrastructure development, we're thinking about other water management um, decisions. So this couldn't be done without a pretty much army of scientists. This is a small fraction um, of all the people that were helping with this project. And I'd love to have any questions. And it's, it's a really interesting system that I don't think people really study to 
I'm, I'm thinking about Audrey Sawyer has done a little work. So Audrey Sawyer has, um, she's in the School of Earth Sciences at OSU. Um, she's done some really cool coastal work with um, groundwater inputs into the oceans. I know she did a little work with Lake Erie, um, but it's definitely something she and I have talked about trying to. She, um, she's more of a pure hydrologist and a little model than I do, where I pull in the chemistry. So we're actually kind of a perfect pair in that because we have like complementary um, stuff. So it's definitely something I've had on my radar to think about. Um, something I've been thinking about looking into with some of the wetlands along the coast of Lake Erie. Too, um, because wetlands are going to have different spots where you've got water going under and spots where you've got water coming up. And if we're hoping that some of these wetlands will maybe eat up some of the nutrients before they go to Lake Erie, you know. So, so yeah, I think it's a huge question. And I think when we're thinking about um, water quality species in Lake Erie, it's like, okay, well, how much is coming from the Maumee versus, you know, this longer legacy work?
question. Um, a lot of these principles are how watersheds work to some degree. I think a lot of the questions I'm working on here is starting to think about with the rivers here is what degree to which are they groundwater dominated? Because I know there is groundwater, but you're not, you don't have the snow dominated ecosystem. You don't have the, the high altitude. Um, the same types of measurements, the same types of looking at things, you know, that's all comparable to anywhere we go. Um, the Baltimore ecosystem study that I had the picture from, they've been doing, I think, 30 years of urban hydrology and watershed work there, and they're seeing the same thing. Groundwater matters. Um, there's a, also studies in Phoenix, which is more like Utah, the same thing, groundwater matters. And so that's one of the big things we're trying to, uh, urban hydrologists are bringing up more and more and more and more. And, and urban hydrology is still a relatively new sub-discipline of like actually, you think about what's happening under our feet. Uh, you know, you don't see it, you don't think about it, um, which is pretty normal. I never thought about it until I started studying it. <laughs> but yeah, it's one thing that we're trying to look at right now, digging into some of the urban streams in Columbus and being like, okay, what is going on? Rebute Creek probably won't. Rebute Creek um, is very small. So nobody uses it as a drinking water source anymore. Um, but it's one of the many rivers that are feeding into that Jordan River, which is an issue. And well, Rebute and Rebute Creek, the other creeks have a similar hydrology. They're still groundwater dominated. Um, and so it's not enough new, it's not enough nitrates that are having like big algal growth or anything in that location. Um, so it's hard to tell exactly when, if anything, will happen with that one, but it's given us an idea of what to look at in these other bigger rivers there. Ruby Creek also had a big oil spill um, a handful of years ago, so one thing we were kind of also interested in is if we were going to see any oil residue of that kind of went down. Yeah, Tiny Little Creek had an oil pipe that burst into it. It also does feed a lake in a park, in a public park, so people care about it for that. Um, but yeah, it's one of those, like, and the levels, even the nitrate levels that do exist, they're not at a toxic level. You know, they're high, but they're not toxic. Right. Okay, thanks, Rachel. Why don't we take just a couple of minutes, maybe like just five after, just to stand up and stretch a little bit before we introduce our, our next speaker. So we'll just pause here for a little bit. That's lecture for tonight. So we, we have uh, Dr. Jeff Sharp with us. Um, so, uh, Chair of the School of Environment and Natural Resources. Just like I asked of uh, Rachel, he's going to kind of talk to you about his route on, on where he started and when, where he is now. Uh, so I won't steal his thunder about rattling off all of his master's and PhD degrees. Uh, so I will turn it over to uh, Dr. Sharp. Please join me in welcome to Dr. Sharp. I knew Rachel was going to be uh, presenting before me, and uh, I know that she's highly visual. So I realized that uh, for me to even try to sort of put a PowerPoint together and share that with you all would sort of like pale in comparison to sort of take a bunch of stuff, put a graphic together. And mine would have really been just a glorified outline. So uh, I'm going to just speak to you a little bit about um, uh, some of the things that uh, I thought would be pertinent to uh, um, the topic that was proposed to you. I apologize that I'm a little hot. And I'll bring this, I'll bring, I'll circle back to that toward the end of my presentation. But uh, uh, I'm hot because uh, Chris was so kind as to volunteer for me to bring my family up here with you. And, uh, they were. They told me they would be here. Rachel's presentation. They weren't. And so I like. Uh, this is sort of parent. This is really symptomatic. I think of where we're at today. I was like, where are they at? I mean, I'm. I'm worried. You know. So it's like I got out of sight. They're my wife's with them. So I ran to the other side of the island because Chris showed off where the sort of swimming hole was. I got over there. They're not there. I come back and I find out that there's a. There's a. Um, um, one of your staff gave them a ride back over to mainland and stuff. But the point is, I was very worried. And so I was overprotective, and I ran to the other end of the island to see if they were there, you know, thinking that somebody had broken their arm earlier. It's like, okay, well, maybe something happened there. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's symptomatic of something I'll circle back toward the end. But I apologize. I'm a little hot for that, but I'll circle back to, like, why that's germane uh, uh, toward the end of my remarks. Um, uh, before I get into them, though, I thought um, uh, Chris asked, sort of like, uh, I, I, some of you um, maybe are, are you using RC? Your first years, you've seen me sort of talk about my journey into SDNR. So um, I've, I've talked about this with some of our students at, at school before. But um, I think it's helpful sometimes to know how we've gotten to where we're at. And uh, um, for many of us here, I think we all share a love of the environment and are committed to it and stuff. So it's helpful for some people, particularly young folks, to sort of have some perspective on how some, about how some of us got to where we're at. So I'm the director of the School of Environment and Natural Resources. I did not think when I was uh, 19 years old that this would be the kind of job I would have. Um, but I, I am here. I even, like when I was 19, I did not have any interest whatsoever in being in the environmental um, field. Um, I grew up on a farm, which was uh, a, a very rich environmental experience that was not something that I had aspired to have anything to do with when I left the farm when I was 18 years old. Um, I went to college as a, a, a freshman at Iowa State University and majored in political science. I knew I liked politics and the social sciences, so I went to Iowa State. Uh, I went to 
two years, three years at Iowa State, and I had nothing to do with agriculture or rural uh, uh, environments. So that was the furthest thing from my mind. Interestingly, then, when I was a senior at Iowa State, I had a chance to take a course on ag policy. Um, it really got me excited about um, 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 kind of agro um, issues. At the same time, I got a chance to be an intern in the Iowa State Legislature, and this was in, um, uh, to date myself, I'm 50 years old, so um, this would have been 1989, which was a big deal in Iowa at that time because there was a, a piece of legislation called the Groundwater Protection Act that was passed at this particular time. I had a chance to intern in the Iowa State Legislature for the chair of the uh, Agricultural uh, Committee, and I was very closely associated with the chair of the Environment Committee in the state of uh, in the Iowa House of, of Representatives, and so I had a, some very firsthand exposure to some folks that were working really hard to bring water quality issues to the forefront. What was the big deal about that is this was one of the first pieces of legislation in the state in the, uh, in the nation that actually pesticide the um, um, uh, chemical input industry allowed itself to be taxed to sort of divert some resources to actually doing studies as to like what were the uh, negative consequences of, of various uh, uh, chemical input uh, pollution. And so the Leopold Center for Sustainable Ag was created at this time. So I got kind of excited about agroecology. I read, read, read Wendell Berry. Um, and so I was kind of on my way um, to sort of thinking about these things. But I kind of took a detour and went into um, graduated, uh, did politics for a while. Politics is not really a career because it's like cyclical. You've got, you got a job for like nine months out of every two years, and then you've got to figure out what you're going to do the other part of that time. So I, I, I uh, worked campaigns, and I worked in the legislature uh, as a uh, um, um, legislative associate. And then uh, uh, I did what I called my, my National Park Roundabout. So uh, I decided to sort of like um, – pick up roots and just sort of like at the end of a legislative session, I decided I'd go out and work at Glacier National Park as a uh, seasonal employee for a summer. Went out and did that. Um, had a great time. Worked in a gift shop that hiked 360 miles in Glacier National Park and did a lot of off-trail um, climbing. Um, that was wonderful. I then had a friend that was moving to Duluth, Minnesota, and I thought I decided I'd try winter sports. So I headed to Duluth, Minnesota, and I lived in Duluth for the winter season and cross-country speed and, and uh, um, learned a lot about the uh, um, hiking trail and that part of the country, and I love um, the upper, um, um, that, that's the North Shore of Lake Superior. Uh, and then I ended up just going down to Grand Canyon and working a season down there, a, a, a summer season down there, and then I decided to do graduate school. By that time, I kind of knew I wanted to do agriculture, rural, uh, environmental type topics. And so I did a master's and then a PhD. I'm actually trained as a sociologist, so um, uh, I, am, uh, I, I love the social sciences, and I, I really work hard to um, really understand the social sciences. And over time, I've come to appreciate how my disciplinary expertise can actually impact the uh, work of uh, peers of mine that are working in some of the more natural and biological sciences. So uh, kind of a roundabout way, uh, I at one point had nothing, no interest whatsoever in working with uh, agro-environmental issues, but uh, sometimes you just know something about something, and it's like you kind of capitalize that in a thesis form that uh, led me to where I am today. As director of the school, um, my job now uh, is not to really do research, so I'm not going to share with you a research proposal, although uh, out of the presentation, although um, I can talk research with you if you do want to talk, if you get bored with this presentation and want to take me in a different direction than the question and answer, uh, I can talk to you a lot about local food systems and how they may or may not be good for the environment or may or may not be good for uh, achieving some of the social goals that you all uh, 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 sometimes aspire to sort of achieve with local food systems. So, uh, but what I want to talk about today is um, the School of Environment and Natural Resources and really talk about kind of higher education and, and our role and responsibility community uh, through uh, um, um, our kind of institutional organization. Uh, the preface for this is that it is the 50th anniversary of the School of Environment and Natural Resources at Ohio State University. On July 1, 1968, uh, um, legislation um, uh, moved through the uh, um, various approval systems and we officially came into existence on, on that date in 1968. So we're really only a few days removed from our 50th uh, uh, birthday party, um, birthday celebration. We've been celebrating as a school, though, for um, in um, April of this last year, we started our celebration, and we will continue our celebration until April May. So we kind of started things up around Earth Day, and we'll wrap them up around Earth Day next week. And then we're going to get all geared up for the 50th anniversary of Earth Day in 1960, which will be in uh, um, 2020. So um, a lot of exciting anniversaries. And, and, and time to be talking about this in some ways is that um, uh, these schools of environment and natural resources that kind of popped up across the country during this time period, as long as it's been water ads, the uh, um, um, 
before then, um, the environmental sciences uh, were spread across a lot of different um, spaces, and they still are at Ohio State. We still have a lot of environmental departments. But um, in 1968, we made a commitment to uh, bringing together uh, a diversity of uh, faculty with a commitment to, and I think our, our initial mission was to really train people to work in the environmental management. So uh, we were really from the get-go not intending to become a biological department where we were going to focus in on the bi very narrow biological questions or, uh, or science department to focus on very narrow geological questions. But we were really sort of committed to sort of training the future managers. To train future managers required more than just a very uh, deep knowledge of a particular sort of disciplinary sort of area. It requires a kind of a broad sort of spectrum. So our, our early day years included uh, uh, conservation education, um, uh, environmental management. Uh, we had wildlife uh, specialists. We had forestry folks. Uh, we had uh, environmental educators, uh, interpreters. We had a whole variety of sort of folks that were uh, from a variety of disciplines. And our real core goal was a professional school to train. And um, I'm curious, so I ask, so how many of you are graduates of the school? So I know there are a few of you that are here that have graduated. So there are a couple of you. So, and a couple of you are students in the school. I do want to sort of um, uh, bring your attention to celebrate this, this great day. I did bring some posters that we've got to commemorate this. So I encourage you to take a, a poster. Um, we have actually a series of six of them. This is our first one. Unfortunately, our water quality one is being rolled out next Tuesday. So I, I did not bring that with us. Uh, we're doing a tour of the Olentangy River down in Columbus, and we'll be rolling that out. But if you'd like one of these, or if you happen to know somebody um, that you think would appreciate one of these, that even if you're not a graduate of the school, please take one and, and pass it along. Um, we think it's a, a, a lovely poster. And uh, uh, we have a series of six of them, and you can go to our website and find out more information on how you might get the, the rest of them. But um, uh, I bring that up partly as a, a token because uh, our success has been that we have about 10,000 graduates um, throughout um, that have graduated from the school. And, and one of the opportunities with our 50th anniversary is to, uh, uh, to reconnect with some of you and, and, and help you to amplify your story even more and, and make connections. But uh, this would be a token that we'd like to, to share with you. So we are a professional school um, that really was focused on the, uh, uh, the management um, and uh, um, training the future generation of folks that would populate some of our, our key sort of life organizations in the state of Ohio, and particularly the Ohio Business Development Department that for resources, um, uh, the various uh, um, subgroups there. We don't have uh, an environmental protection agency, et cetera. Um, when it comes to sort of like where the school is today, um, we have evolved a lot. So we, um, we had a large influx of students in the early days, um, and uh, um, there was a lot of enthusiasm in the 1970s for environmental topics. The 1980s was a tough time for those of us in the environmental field. Um, I think uh, um, there was a, uh, politically there was just not a lot going on that was positive related to um, um, the federal government uh, related to the environment. And we saw a tapering off of students. Now, some people sort of say that, well, environmental fields tend to do better when you have, um, I don't know, you hear some say, well, we do better when we have supportive administrations, and you hear someone say that we do better when we don't have supportive administrations. I don't know what the, 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 the story is, but I can tell you in the 1980s, we hit some, some low points, and this would have been during the Reagan years, and there was a very uh, wide use movement, and there was a real counter-reaction against the environmental movement. You might look at today and sort of say, well, where are we at? I can tell you that um, our numbers are as good as they've ever been. In fact, we're hitting record enrollments in the school. So I think there might be independence of political context. There's a, been a generational shift in terms of just people are, are interested and, and, and aware of the consequences of how the environment's been treated. And we've seen a steady influx of students that have wanted to either take an environmental major or that have a, a taken an environmental course. So we have about 750 to 800 students in our school's environment now at Ohio State. I know that some of our peer departments that also do ecology, environment, sort of sciences have had um, some recently um, some good enrollments there too. So um, it's a, uh, um, in terms of the, where we've gone, we've trained a lot of people and, and we continue to do so. Yeah. Today though, the school has evolved. So back in those days, we would have been very focused on management. We still are. Um, uh, and many of you, I think that you're working here at some lab, I'm sure that you're very concerned about like, what are the practical implications of what you're studying? Uh, and that continues to be, I think, a, a primary uh, interest attribute of, of the, uh, the type of school we aspire to be. But we've evolved a bit. Um, and I think um, uh, I'll open this one up for just some interaction in terms of like, so we can be focused on management. Um, but what does that mean? How do, we, how do we effectively manage environmental issues? So what does this take? I'm just curious. What, is this, what, do, what do we need to do to sort of achieve our goal of managing the environmental system, to, to training the next generation manager? Okay, so we need some problem identifiers, so we need to have um, pretty good understanding of 
sort of like what the um, good observational skills to sort of understand what those are and sort of like the system. Increased awareness. So what um, you think the public need to be more attuned to this? Okay. You okay though? So I think okay. okay. It's just your own personal training. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Understand stakeholder value. We have to have sort of systems thinking. Um, any other ideas? Yeah. What's that? Legislative control. Okay. Okay, so you guys, okay, yeah, go ahead. Okay, interdisciplinary team. Yeah, that's good. So this is what I'm circling to. Sort of like, I see it's interesting. You talk, a lot of you talked about uh, a lot of things that are have little to do with sort of like the hard sciences that I oftentimes would think that some lab would be associated with in terms of sifting down into the, uh, the water and measuring sort of like at um, contextually, our school has evolved to the point where it's like we appreciate this from a managerial standpoint. We've got to have an understanding of the depth of the sort of disciplinary knowledge. We need to understand sort of like you know the, the water quality issues that Rachel was talking about. We need to understand the um, sociology things that Suzanne might be looking at. We need to understand the, the soil science attributes that Rashawn Wall might want us to look at. We need to we need to have a, a good understanding for systems that David Hicks might bring to the table, who's one of our faculty. But um, we have to have that, but we also have to have this broader sort of like understanding of the social context. And so our school actually, um, and this is um, um, the thing that a lot of the schools of environment natural resources around the country is um, that we oftentimes have um, social sciences right alongside the natural sciences. Now I'll tell you in practice, and so one of my jobs as a director is, um, is to sort of like lead, lead where people are going. So you can lead from in front or you can lead from behind. My, my job largely is, is with academics, you can't sort of get out in front of them and sort of say, this is where you're going to go. You kind of have to stand behind them and kind of like nudge them a little bit um, <laughs> and uh, create incentives because they, they get excited about those things. But um, so it's one thing to sort of say this is what we need, this big overarching sort of like um, um, point of view. But in practice, um, and I'll just really speak it for the undergrads that are here, it's like you're, you're, um, a lot of your faculty are, are rewarded for actually having a very deep knowledge of a particular special area of, of um, space. So there's really not a lot of rewards for sort of people thinking at this sort of broader level that integrate across. So earlier we were having a conversation with some of the REU students, and uh, there was one student, um, Jerry? Or, or was there? Uh, Matt was describing his work, and I got kind of excited because he was talking about he was talking about uh, invasive species, he was talking about forest systems, he was talking about um, soil science. Um, honestly, you don't find a whole lot of like your professors that are actually at the, working at that level that would get excited about all those three or four disciplines that he was espousing there. So that becomes a real challenge in terms of how do we um, uh, educate the next generation. And I, I can tell you that um, as we've sort of added faculty to our community, I think one of the things that I see as an important attribute for um, anybody that's going to work in a space is you have to have some of that knowledge, that depth knowledge. So if some of you are going to be working in a forest system, you better know your tree identification. Um, if you're going to be working in, in aquatic systems, you need to know some, you know, you need to know your fish taxonomy. You need to know those things. But you also need to have some natural curiosity. And that's one of the things that really stands out to me in terms of both the students that we track to the school and the faculty and the staff is there's a natural curiosity. Uh, and there's a natural curiosity that they get excited about what somebody else is doing. Now, in the short term, the faculty sometimes are not sort of like incentivized or really motivated to, uh, um, and not motivation is not the right word, they're just not incentivized to sort of like work with these other people, but they're curious about what these other people are doing. Um, but where we do sort of like work to try to sort of like make the connections is through our curriculum. And so many of the students that come to our school, and I hope this is true for some of the other students, some of the other students that are going to other environmental programs, is the curriculum required you to take sort of science across the broad array of disciplines. And I think that's critical. But I do recognize that you need to have some of that in depth. So hopefully your Stone Lab experience, there was a, a, one amongst you I know that was sharing that you're a policy major and you're studying sort of fish. And it's like that's, you know, that's quite a leap from what I would expect a lot of sort of science students to be doing. But, you know, if you're really going to deal with this question of awareness, um, dealing with the sort of legislative sort of question, it's going to require us to have some people at the table dealing with policy that have some understanding of not only what the policy and poly policy process, but also fish. They're going to have to know something about sort of like some of the problems that are occurring on Lake Erie. They're going to have to have some, have some understanding of the science. We touch the bias of the school. Sometimes um, we feel like we feel like we're, we're, we're fighting a rear guard battle. We're like the monks in a, in a, in a monastery. They're keeping the knowledge alive and hopes that somebody will someday come to our door and ask for it. <laughs> Um, but, um, um, you know, I think the important thing is that we have to be sort of committed to sort of like knowing that science and also sort of like being curious about sort of the bigger context. So my hope is that uh, uh, we graduate from the school through our curriculum and through the various faculty, the diversity of faculty, that students that maybe have an interest in environmental sciences will take that policy course, will take that values and cultures course, will take that sociology course, it will elevate them up. Vice versa, I hope that a person that's doing the policy or the sociology or the economic side of it will end up sort of taking some of that science. 
terms of our goals, I just wanted to so I put interdisciplinarity. So um, you guys nailed it in terms of sort of like the uh, um, change that evolved about the school. It's a, a, we became much more an interdisciplinary program, and we have 40 some faculty now, of which um, about 14 or 15 are social scientists, um, and the other 25 or so are, are um, um, natural and physical scientists that um, um, can bring a lot to our, our collective team. Um, a couple things I wanted to highlight then in terms of goals today. So while we're an interdisciplinary program, we've started to deliver an interdisciplinary um, um, uh, curriculum. Uh, we have three primary goals. Provide leadership. Um, provide this. Um, one of the commitments, um, I think all of us working in higher education, and I know this is faculty at other institutions here, um, I, I, I'm not really being, I'm not really joking when I'm talking about sort of like the monks and the monasteries. I do think there's a, there's a, there's a particular juncture for us to be committed to science and sort of like um, um, creating the knowledge that's necessary to make the management decisions. Now, the world around us sometimes might discount our science and might not be committed to it, but I think there are some of us that are, those of us in the academy are committed to the fact that science and, and well-informed policy based on science will actually have an impact. So your base will talk about hydrology and sort of like Columbus is making a huge commitment to rain gardens. And it's like to hear the possibility that, you know, the scientists are ambiguous about this. It's like, how did we get to this point? People look at rain gardens, it's like, oh, they look lovely. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, we need to make sure that there's policies based on science. And even when we're dealing with the, uh, and Chris, I'm sure, hears this a lot too, when we're talking about Lake Erie and the um, uh, water quality issues and the concerns about agriculture, I think agriculture is willing to accept its responsibility for what's going on there. They just want to make sure that any policy decisions we make on their behalf are based on science and they are going to work. They do not want to go down a path where it's like some good intentions sort of like, you know, looks pretty sort of thing, sort of just sort of foisted upon them, and it not, does not solve the problem. So, um, so again, in the academy, we're um, committed to science, and I think that's where, in some ways, that's where we provide leadership is, is to our science. And so what you're doing here at Stone Lab, either as a student or eventually through your REU project or, or whatever, is actually helping us to provide that leadership uh, that's necessary for us to deal with environmental problems. And, uh, um, and I do think that um, um, being effective in communicating our science and actually being sensitive to sort of like the management implications of our science will help us be more effective, and I think that's where Stone Lab in particular stands out in terms of being a go-to place if not national, in terms of how to deal with these things. Educating students and the public is the second goal of ours. Um, none of these goals are more important than the others, but really, um, at the end of the day, we are an institution that educates students. And uh, um, what an honor it is for us to be able to sort of like um, educate the next generation of students. I'm so excited to sort of see the enthusiasm that comes through at Stone Lab among students. Uh, and we're excited about um, being able to sort of allow our students this opportunity to come to Stone Lab, but it's like it's one of our primary goals. Third one is probably the one that most motivates our faculty. Um, although we have some um, amazing um, faculty that are very committed to all three mission areas, but we uh, generate new knowledge through research, and that's sort of like something that me as a manager, I spend a lot of time thinking about how I can sort of find resources for my students, sort of like um, do better science, and how we can sort of create opportunities for graduate students and undergrads to sort of do science. So when I learn about sort of the things that everybody's doing, it's sort of like it's a positive uh, um, cycle here, and I'm sure Chris is in the same position, where we take the stories we hear of your science, we go out and tell people about it, they sort of like get more enthused about it and give us more support. And so um, in terms of our goals, that's uh, one of them is to generate new knowledge and to, um, and to actually make that knowledge relevant to the population. Um, a couple things I wanted to highlight then about the school, and then I'll sort of like just talk about a few challenges, and then we'll, we'll um, wrap up with some Q&A. Um, uh, we're a big school. Um, the state of Ohio, we're fortunate to have a lot of very strong environmental programs. So, um, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a great state for doing environmental work. We actually have a very strong tradition in, in environmental work. We have some um, um, not so uh, Lake Erie and the Cuyahoga are two things that sort of like we have some real problems that are, you know, globally significant challenges. And it's, um, I think those of us, all of us in, in associated with higher education, um, have a responsibility to, uh, um, to be attentive to that. But uh, um, it's just a, it's a great, great tradition. Um, so I like just a little bit about the school, and I do want to brag a little bit uh, for those of you that are considering undergrads here that might aspire to go on to graduate school eventually. Um, we have a great faculty. Um, we have actually a, a faculty that's very committed to teaching, and I did want to uh, call out um, Suzanne Gray, who actually received one of the highest awards given to Ohio State University faculty for continuous teaching, the Distinguished Alumni Teaching Award. Suzanne won that award this last year, um, which is a great honor. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to take away it all away from Suzanne, but interestingly, the school actually has four distinguished uh, alumni teaching award alumni winners on our staff right now. Suzanne was our fourth one. We have Jacob Sullivan, who some of you maybe have seen before, come up here. He's a, um, a standout faculty as well. And Brian Lauer, for any of you that have taken environmental science or uh, um, um, maybe even for like seen some of our um, 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 college credit plus programs, he's a, he's a standout in that regard. And then Joe Donnemeyer is another faculty who's hired that has won that. Um, we also have actually in our school the. Uh, Distinguished University professor and one of the top cited 
interest in um, um, uh, urban carnivores, um, uh, urban coyotes, sand here is, is one of the standouts in the school. So if, uh, if you're ever looking for um, some of this, that's just there. We have a couple social scientists that are standouts in their field. So Jackson Smith in particular is one that, um, uh, from working on interdisciplinary topics, is uh, probably the um, best macro high level sort of strategic thinker we have in the school in terms of weaving together interdisciplinary teams. Interestingly, the I Utah project that Rachel was part of, Doug was uh, part of that at Utah before he came to Ohio State. And now he works with Chris working on water quality issues. But he's, um, he's one of those folks that I really um, I, I look to for leadership in terms of achieving sort of scientific excellence and weaving things together. Um, but anyway, so we have, we have a, a faculty that we're very proud of. I've talked about our students a bit, that we have a, a large population of students. Um, where I wanted to wrap up then was talking a little bit about um, uh, what I see as some of the challenges we have going forward. So um, we're a school that has a long tradition. Hopefully we've had a, a positive impact on the state of Ohio. And we have so many graduates out there, and we listen very closely to, to our stakeholders, what they're, what they're informing uh, us about what some of the issues are. Uh, but I did want to sort of share with you what I think I'm hearing from folks that um, uh, I think we need to be attentive to in the, in the environmental field. And uh, some of you that are students, I think, can um, um, take, uh, um, take some speech in this. Um, one of the things that disappoints me to learn, so I'll, I'll start out with sort of like, I listen to stakeholders about like what they're saying about our graduates from our environmental program. Um, one of the concerns I'm hearing from some of our employers is they're concerned that students are coming out of Ohio State, and I'm sure this might be true of some of the other schools, is they don't have a hands-on experience. And this might not be true of you all, but it's like, uh, if, if we have folks coming into the environmental field who do not have the outdoor experience that maybe a previous generation of wildlife and uh, natural resource managers maybe had. And this isn't even just true of the, the, the resource management sort of field, and even environmental sciences in general, but what we need is sort of like um, um, make sure we're providing a hands-on experience. This is something the school has really made a commitment to, and I hope that some of the students you're all coming to from have done so. And if they haven't, then it's great that you're coming to Stone Lab because you should be getting that kind of experience here too. But I tell you, it kills me when I talk to sort of like some of our employers and they're sort of saying, you know, those Ohio State grads are great at, at year about three or four, but it's those first year or two where we have to sort of get them out and like teach them how to use a chainsaw or teach them how to like, you know, move a boat, uh, you know, uh, navigate a boat or, you know, lots of just sort of basic things. I mean, things that, you know, I think it's through experience previous generation of, of environmental professionals might have had that experience. Uh, but the point would be is um, this is one thing that our school and I think many of the environmental fields need to be attentive to is making sure we provide those kind of experiences. I'll circle back to my kids who I was worried about them and I ran down there. I'm worried that we're sort of like um, uh, uh, hovering a little bit and I, I don't need to worry about them as much as I do, but it's like we need to provide opportunities for kids to get out in nature and sort of like experience that I think. Or at least we, if they don't have that experience coming into college, interestingly, in college, College level can provide those experiences to folks. So uh, it's not something I think that um, um, we would have been thinking about even 10 years ago, but increasingly it's something that I think we need to be attentive to. And, and I just know from an employer standpoint, they want to have the whole package. They want to have somebody that's well trained, well educated, who's got this college degree, but they also want somebody that actually has some of the basic sort of skills that they have. So my encouragement to you all, students, is take advantage of some of the, the, the specialized training that you might get. Testified applicator training, it might not sound that glamorous, but it might be actually useful to have that on your, um, on your skill set. Uh, training saw training, uh, you know, even first aid training. Um, uh, at Ohio State, we give um, um, wildlife uh, um, fire certifications for people that want to go out and work and, and uh, afford you. But I think increasingly in higher ed, we're going to have to think about, like, not only providing a college degree, but actually providing opportunities for you to get those kind of certifications. And so we've been talking to Chris about how do we create more professional development opportunities here at Stone Lab for students here and get those and how do we do that in general, but um, that's something I think that um, um, we can be attentive to. Another thing that I'm sensitive to is, um, uh, and this is true, uh, higher ed has been moving in this direction for a while, but I think um, increasingly uh, many of you that are going to graduate from your university realize that um, your connection to your university or any of the higher ed institutions in the state of Ohio will not end the day you graduate. Increasingly, I think we have a responsibility, Ohio State is our land grant mission, we have a responsibility to be attentive to your professional development needs. And I think as, a, as we think about the future of the environmental field and the evolution there, um, we're going to have to remain sort of connected to you all uh, and providing you ongoing training because uh, some of the things that you will be asked to do down the road are things that uh, um, your employer might not be able to provide that to you or your employer is willing to support it, but they need you to go find it someplace. And one of our responsibilities, I think, at Ohio State, and again at some of the other higher institutions, is to figure out ways that we can provide those kind of training to you too. So um, it, uh, I, I expect that um, we're going to see an improvement in our um, professional development opportunities through our program. We already have quite a few different programs that we administer that maybe you settle out into environmental professional positions. You will 
probably sort of be exposed to some of those programs. So we need to make it easier for you to sort of find those um, those professional development opportunities and at least keep your skills uh, up to uh, up to the level they need to be. And especially with the science and let's say what's happening in Lake Erie, this is a, this is an evolving issue that we need to be constantly attentive to how we train you all. So um, being attentive to how we provide those professional development opportunities and, and supporting professionals beyond simply their your experience right now is, is key to something we need to change. Um, I've already echoed this once, but I think this commitment to science. So I don't want to feel like there's there's lots of environmental programs out there, and there's lots of different ways that they can be structured. Um, we at Ohio State thinks that our program has made a commitment to science, and uh, um, that's a very conscious sort of decision. And I don't want to take away from sort of like more humanities-driven programs, and I think those are important and they're 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 meaningful. But I do think that we need to be sure that we maintain some cadre of environmental science um, and a very strong commitment to that um, science. Certain cases, and we need to make sure that we understand the strengths and limitations of what our scientific understanding is. Uh, I do worry that sometimes that um, uh, the environmental field, and I'm guilty of this too because I'm not trained as a natural scientist, but I can aesthetically enjoy a national park or I can enjoy a natural area, but I do not understand all the systems that go on there. I would have to defer to, like, if it's a, a water system, I'd have to defer to, defer to Rachel to sort of like provide me the expertise I need for that. Uh, we need to acknowledge our limitations as scientists, but we also need to be very committed to sort of making sure that we find the science. And we promote the science and we really address it. So I should not be making decisions on what a uh, appropriately managed stream in, in, in Central Ohio looks like. Uh, that's not my area of expertise, and I need to be careful that I don't over uh, overdo it sometimes in terms of sort of like uh, representing some some ideas that maybe don't have scientific validity. And I need to make sure I bring those people that are the scientists to the table that that have that expertise. And I just just a word of caution. I think. Um, one of the problems in the environmental field is we have sometimes a lot of opinions out there, and there are a lot of well-intentioned opinions, but sometimes they are not backed up by science, and that we need to be diligent in that. So it's like, uh, I think that's something that uh, um, I see as an ongoing thing. We actually have um, a couple of our faculty that have been, um, um, that fluid sort of decisions in terms of some of the advisory committees and sort of purging some of the scientists off of some of those committees and thinking you can bring business people to the, uh, the table. We have one of our scientists in the school, Robin Wilson, who's been involved in a lawsuit scientists so like taking the task the fact that she was removed from one of those committees but she's willing to stand up and take a stand for science and I think that's something we all need to make sure that we do but um, I think at the end of the day um, um, at least from my epistemology the science is going to be the thing that's going to help us solve the, uh, the problem. The final thing I wanted to point out is um, uh, diversity. Um, there's a lot of forms of takes and I will say that one of the things I've been struck by, I've been directed for five years and that's enough time to maybe learn enough to be a little bit dangerous uh, and start to understand that there are some trends out there that just don't quite make sense. I can tell you that Ohio State, it could be, you know, for a variety of reasons, but, uh, and I don't want to take from, get away from any sort of like uh, groups or whatsoever, but um, we attract students that are admitted into the Columbus campus as first years um, disproportionately come from suburban districts, suburban high schools. Um, and that's not to say that um, there aren't scientists, students that are coming out of some of the urban and the more rural places, but we seek to diversify sort of the, the population of students that are, are coming to environmental science. Partly it's like I think because suburban districts have environmental science, they have the capacity that they can have environmental science uh, programs. They have uh, um, instructors that are teaching that environmental science. They can get turned on. If you're in an urban district or rural district, you might have a biology teacher, and then you know maybe you'll get a little environmental science there, but you're not going to get you know um, turned on to it. But um, we need to find um, um, people to study that come from these backgrounds that kind of understand the context of what we're managing. So when we're going into the urban areas and talking about water management. And we have folks going to those neighborhoods that have no understanding of sort of like how the social dynamics work, um, kind of like how people relate to the environment. It's going to create some challenges for us. So we need to diversify in terms of sort of like our, at least our Ohio State in our school. We need to diversify in terms of sort of where students are coming from geographically. There's also a racial component to that in terms of like who's actually um, becoming part of our, um, um, that we're getting an opportunity to sort of educate. Uh, we have a large population of students that I think would be great. Um, um, achieve great success in the environmental field, but they just never get a chance to even realize that's an opportunity, and so we need to diversify that approach. I can tell you the employers are looking for this diversity as well. Um, we have um, uh, an interesting project with First Energy, which is the energy company around the Cleveland area, but um, they're very interested in actually having um, people working in their neighborhoods on, they have some environmental issues they need to deal with in terms of like transmission lines and all that kind of stuff. They'd like to have a workforce that represents the people that they're working with in their communities. Columbus Metro Parks is another one. They love to have a workforce that is very consistent with the population of people that use Metro Parks. Um, to actually serve the population we aspire to serve, um, we need to sort of like diversify ourselves. And when, I, I worry sometimes when we bring up diversity, it's always sort of like we treat it as a zero-sum game. Well, if we make it more diverse, it makes it not as many other opportunities for others. This pie is 
so big. We just need to find enough people that can sort of like join the sort of like um, 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 join the curriculum, join the um, 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 and just feel comfortable in the science that they can be part of our our, our community and actually be successful. Because I think that uh, if we deal with some of these management issues, um, you know, we deal with urban forestry. Um, there is much a cultural contextual issue in terms of sort of like how people respond to sort of like foresters that come in to tell them this is how it should be done. They're going to respond differently to a forester that's representative and similar to them than they will from a forester from somebody that's from outside their community that doesn't speak the language. So um, diversity is one of those things that, um, that I feel like um, we need to be thinking about. I'm excited to these tools that we have, a, a, a cadre of faculty and staff and students that are very excited about sort of like figuring out ways that we can promote diversity. Um, you know, I think that um, there might be opportunity for us to sort of meet some lab um, uh, and collaborate with you all down the road in terms of how we can sort of promote that. But uh, really just, we're right now at the fact saving finding stage, and I can tell you it's kind of starting to me to sort of see sort of like where the students are coming from and, and sort of like how much of a hole we're in in terms of really putting this on the ground. And it's going to take us for years to do this. Some of this Metro Park in Central Ohio has been working at the, um, um, ele the elementary and middle school age just to try to get folks to sort of like to go into an environmental field. The problem is so few get into it that when they do get in the environmental field, uh, they don't want to go back and work for Metro Parks because there's so many other opportunities out there for them and they don't <laughs> choose to circle back. So it's something that we really need to like work on as a, as a, a community of folks that are, are committed to this. And I think higher education has a responsibility to, to work on that. So those are some of the sort of like concerns that I have. Um, but really, I think the, the one I'm excited, and I'll give you all a hands up, uh, 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 a clap of the hands too is uh, the commitment to experiential and hands-on learning. So you know, the fact that you're here is is very critical. Uh, I would encourage you to be ambassadors for Stone Lab and these kind of experiences. And, and there are other places in the country that offer these kind of experiences. So you do not have to just come to Stone Lab, but you know, be ambassadors for this kind of learning. Hopefully, you did get some of the experiences that will make you a better uh, environmental professional down the road. If that's your aspiration, even if you're not, it'll probably make you a better sort of like just uh, uh, environmental. Um, person with an interest in the environment, somebody that cares just on behalf of the environment. So uh, I encourage you to, to, uh, um, to promote that when you get back to your, your community and, and be sure to turn them on to some of the faculty and staff here at Ellen uh, at Stone Lab so that they have some places to be So I'll um, wrap it up with that and just invite any questions or uh, any feedback or thoughts that you all might have. Um, we have a number of students that end up in multiple sort of like situations. 
Um, there are quite a few environmental consulting firms. And again, I know Central Ohio better than I do, like Cuyahoga or um, Hamilton. Um, but my guess is it'd be similar in those two areas too. Is there are some environmental consulting firms that are always looking for talent and sort of like hiring, hiring folks. Um, we have a sustainability major too. That so I would say one thing that's interesting is um, some of our students are actually um, creating opportunities. This is an interesting time in terms of people are, are aware of this and they're sensitive to it. And if you're in the right place at the right time, you can create the opportunities for yourself. So we actually have a couple of our students that settled out in like local food businesses in Central Ohio um, that I'm aware of that um, have actually turned into becoming our sustainability coordinators. So Lane Grant Brewery is one in Columbus that um, has become very popular. Um, the, the, one of our sustainability majors actually was working down there and sort of started talking about a company about like how they could actually make some improvements. And, before you know it, he's got like the job of being the sustainability director there or some sort of like effect. Um, Jenny's Ice Cream is another one where one of our graduates is working as a sustainability director there. We also have some students that are doing national searches, and I think that's one where it's like, um, you know, I think um, Ohio State has a problem here, and maybe some of the other institutions are better at this. A lot of students want to settle out in Ohio, so we just, you know, nudging them out the door is a challenge. But, um, uh, um, you know, I'd say um, getting internships with different regions of the country is really a pathway to them getting very interesting jobs. So we have a number of students working for NGOs and internships there um, and uh, um, turn those into opportunities. So it's really, um, uh, I would say that if you're willing to sort of like um, hustle a bit, there's a lot of opportunities out there for you. Um, the jobs aren't necessarily always going to just come to you. So that's one of the things I think if I were going to sort of point to like the outcome. Uh, the students that sort of like really took seriously their internship opportunities, the fact that you're here at Stone Lab is going to probably help many of you out in terms of sort of putting that on your resume that you had this sort of like this kind of experience. Um, so there's um, uh, so it ranges from traditional natural resource fields to sort of like being in the right place and creating your own opportunities. Um, and there are a lot of students that actually the environmental field I'm also sensitive to is like people just want a college degree. So there's a lot of people that get an environmental degree and will do nothing in the environment, and that's perfectly acceptable because there are so many things to do. And you know, to be honest, if I sort of picked my degree and I graduated that, and that's what I'm stuck having to only work in that field for the rest of my life, you know, that would you know, sometimes you get to the point where it's like, well, you realize you're not really an environmental scientist and you want to do something else and things like that. But um, so there are a lot of people that actually do not even work in the environmental field because they get out there. And that's not because some of them might say it's because they didn't want to work and that might be true. There are going to be others that just sort of like, they decide to go work for the family business or they decide to go do that. And sort of that. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. It's, it's really, uh, uh, if you look at our, in our employment data, and I can give that to you, it's, uh, um, it's a very eclectic. I want to touch that broad generalization. There's quite a few of them that don't have that. Some students are not taking advantage of some of the other opportunities to sort of like really enrich themselves to the extent they can. So 
I'm not sure we're going to offer chainsaw training class, but I think that would be good. <laughs> if you're going to go in the forestry area, you need to probably stay out of chainsaw and safety training. If you're going to go in eco ecosystem restoration, you probably need FSA on pesticide applicators. And what we need to do is a better job is sort of promoting those applicators. Yeah? Uh, well, I'm asking this for the students, not for myself. But, uh, so, you know, I think another, another job or another career pathway is graduate school. Sure. So I'm wondering what sort of requirements you have for your graduate program. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good point. And I appreciate you bringing it up. I hesitate to always bring that up because I always worry that sometimes students do quickly sort of choose to go to graduate school. So my first my my first response to that is if you're thinking about graduate school, um, in my case I took a couple years off. And I'm not saying that's the best solution, but I do think that there is some benefit to having some real world experience in whatever it is. It doesn't even have to be an environmental field. That's my secret bias. Different folks might have different things. So if you do aspire to go to graduate school, I can tell you that there is a lot of benefits for that kind of training. At Ohio State, we have a pretty active, um, we have a very strong graduate program in terms of quality students we, uh, we attract and the backgrounds they have. Um, if you do have an interest in graduate school, take advantage of some of the professors here that you're interacting with to find out their story about how they found their program. There are a lot of great PhD programs and master's programs around um, the country and in the state of Ohio that you can sort of look to. Uh, at Ohio State, we look at critically um, are these pretty competitive programs. So a high GPA is something that you're probably going to have to have. I, I hate to rattle it off, but if you have a 3.6, if you have 75% average on the GREs or better, uh, and uh, if you have some sort of like um, discernible sort of like connection to the environment, um, that gets you sort of like in the higher cadre of, of students for consideration. That does not preclude you from sort of pursuing it, but it's just sort of like we are a competitive program, and those are the thresholds you have to have. So um, um, being attentive to those sort of like metrics is important. Um, that being said, though, um, working in somebody's lab, um, um, I am, I'm very impressed with a few of our faculty who really, uh, really work with students and sort of like find those students that are, are maybe don't have as much uh, the rigorous training in the background and they can help lift you up and sort of help you out. So um, that would be important. Um, I spend a lot of time graduate students cycle through. So one thing, if you are thinking about graduate school, do talk to your faculty, your, your um, the professors here. Then also go and visit the institution. Um, sort of see what an institution is about. I see a lot of students come in that um, um, aren't sure, you know, I, I was just talking to one two weeks ago where it's like, I'm just not sure if this, my conversation with them, graduate school is really where they need to be going. And that's something that when you go to the institution and visit, um, they can start to give you some critical feedback. It's like, you know, are you really, is this really the best path for you? Because we're not going to just take you into our program just because you're, you're willing to join our program. We want to make sure you're a good fit for our program. So going and visiting the institution, I think, is another um, important thing. The fact that you all are here would suggest to me that you have some of the background that probably make you competitive for uh, being considered for graduate school. So does that answer your question or you might have some ideas? Uh, I think I had something earlier but not uh, <laughs> as you're speaking I was thinking to piggyback not only visiting that first email you send to a potential grad student advisor is needs to be a very carefully email. You don't just say, hey I like environmental science and you're at a university that I think would be cool. Can yeah. I come join your lab? You need to read some of their papers. You need to say I know what you do in your lab. I've seen some of your recent publications. This is what I did as an undergrad. I'd love to come and visit. You really have to spend the time. It's not a casual email that you just toss out when you're looking at the graduate. So bouncing off that, I think something that most undergraduates don't understand is that the grad school, you're not picking the school. You're picking the advisor. And the, it could be a great school or it could be a horrible school, but this advisor does exactly what you want to do and is the world leader in that. So it's very different than the whole undergrad process. That's how we learned to cut Doug off. And it's yeah. Done. It's done. It's done. It's done. Doug Cannon, it went off. He's done. But I will build also, I, I got my first internship when I was an undergrad because, and I was told this post my internship with EPA, I put on my resume that I knew how to run small engines because I was looking for an EPA job that was shocking fish on a river all day. And that person read it and said, hey, if I'm not on the river and my boat breaks, I've got this knucklehead in the back that you might be able to fix that motor. So it wasn't just the grades and the courses, but it was that skill set. And to come back to what ENR, I believe, provides on campus, what we try to provide here at Stone Lab, before you leave this island, write everything that you did down. Fluoropro, Flowcam, Gillnet, you know, put that down there because what you're learning here is the hands-on stuff that Dr. Sharp is talking about that teases you apart from those other applications for internships 
um, for jobs and for graduates. So walk away with a skill set journal that you're going to keep while you're here. And when you go back to your home, I always think of this as kind of a funny, but something you wouldn't think. When Justin did uh, apply for their AU program, one of the things that that was never been seen. So that was very important when we were going to spend all day out on the boat, although your project ended up not being. You know, little things you might not think of, like the, the boat being able to, to operate an engine, could be important. I've got some of my cards up here, so if you have any ideas of things that you would like to see from a professional development or training, maybe not chainsaws on the island, <laughs> yeah. but, but this, uh, the, the new relationship that Jeff and I have started the last two, two and a half years is to really make sure that we're not just offering quality courses up here, but that we're offering other trainings and, and certificates. So we're trying to grow in that direction to build the portfolio that you can have. And again, as you know, looking around the room, not everybody in here is from Ohio State. We are trying to do this to cater to anybody that's coming from within the state and even outside the state. So if you have any suggestions or any questions, my card um, is up here. Um, and if we could give some time to uh, Dr. Sharp again for his presentation. <laughs> Posters, and I did forget one last thing. EPA, think about when it was created, right? Early 70s, you have a bunch of people that were hired in one big chunk because the agency didn't exist, then it did, that are starting to retire. So correct, Jeff, that you probably didn't have a lot of hires last year, but I would anticipate the EPA is going to be bringing on a lot of individuals in the next three to five years. Uh, so start paying attention to EPA postings and EPA jobs. Yeah, and, <laughs> yeah. and so uh, next week we'll see you again. Uh, next week we'll see uh, Stone Lab hosts the annual Harmful Album Doom forecast, forecast. So individuals from NOAA are going to come here and based on Nutrient loading coming primarily out of the Maumee River. They're going to predict how big they feel the balloon will be this season. Uh, there'll be a lot of elected officials on the island. There'll be a lot of media folks on the island. But that evening, um, one of the key scientists that drives that our blog balloon forecast will be presenting for you guys that evening. So that's next Thursday. Take care. Have fun this uh, upcoming week. <laughs>